Okay, so welcome to this next video on the theory of probability. In this video, we are going to discuss the uh, memoryless property more. Uh, so uh, we're going to uh, look at the fact, uh, we're going to, in some sense, prove uh, that the uh, only uh, that the only way that a distribution, a continuous random variable, can have a distribution which is memoryless, is for it to be exponentially distributed. So memoryless property is what we're going is the topic for this video. Okay, uh, so uh, let's say we have uh, some uh, some abstract probability space over here, omega curly f with a probability measure p, and we have some random variable here x, uh, which is mapping you onto the onto the uh, the non uh, the well the positive real numbers, so zero to infinity, uh, and uh, we want to know. Um, um, we, and basically it's going to obey the memory of this property, which is that the probability that x is greater than or equal to some s plus t, given that x is greater than or equal to s, uh, is equal to the probability that x is greater than or equal to t. So basically, if you imagine the uh, positive number, so here's 0, and uh, you have some t uh, you've waited some amount of time s, and then you wait a bit more time, so you go all the way up to s plus t, so this difference here is t. So you ask, what is the probability that I'm going to have to wait longer uh, than t more minutes, given that I've already waited s minutes? So what is the probability uh, that uh, the amount of time that you have to wait from the start of your experiment, from zero, is greater than or equal to s plus t, given that x was greater th uh, that you've already waited s minutes or whatever. Uh, well, basically, uh, it's going to be the same as if you start, if you were still at zero, you were just about to begin the experiment, and you asked me what is the probability that you have to wait um, t minutes, more than t minutes, uh, for your phone call or whatever was the example we were using. Okay, uh, so uh, basically the, ex uh, the experiment doesn't change. If you wait s minutes, it's just as though you begin the experiment again. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what is meant by the memory of this property, that it doesn't remember how long you've been doing the experiment so far already. If you, uh, if you have done been doing the experiment s minutes and you are sitting there and you have done it s minutes, then the chance that the phone call will come uh, in the next t minutes is the same as if you were, were back at the beginning of the experiment and you were still waiting and you wanted to know what's the probability that I will have to wait longer than t minutes. That's basically what it says. Okay, uh, so um, if we look at this equation in a bit more detail, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to be able to derive that the only way that this can possibly be true is if x is exponentially distributed. Uh, so uh, let's have a look at what this means. Uh, so um, let's define, uh, let's say f of little x, f of little x is the CDF, is the CDF uh, of uh, the random variable big X. Uh, then the probability that x is less greater than or equal to t is equal to 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to t, i.e. it is equal to 1 minus uh, f of, um, f of um, little t. Okay, And we will call this function 1 minus f of little t, we'll call it uh, big G of t. Okay, uh, so now uh, we want to work, so uh, on this side of the equation we have big G of t. What we want to work out is what is this conditional probability here. Uh, what is the probability that x is, give, uh, is greater than or equal to s plus t, given that the amount of time you've had to wait is greater than or equal to s? Uh, well, just basically from the definition of conditional probability, this is the probability of the intersection, the probability that s plus t intersect the event that x is greater than or equal to s, divided by the probability that x is greater than or equal to s. So basically, we are looking at, if I get my big colourful pens out again, uh, we are looking at this event that x is greater than or equal to s, so this set coming off up here. And basically, uh, you have a subset here, uh, which is the event that you have to wait longer than s plus t minutes. Okay? Uh, and basically, we're saying consider this blue set as the whole probability space now. And what is, uh, we want to update, we want to say, okay, uh, we want to give, uh, we know what the probability of uh, s plus t was 
in the original probability space, i.e. all the way from zero, uh, but now I want to update it. I want to make the, clearly its probability here is now going to be bigger uh, if you have as your new probability space this blue, just this blue thing, because it doesn't contain all of this. Uh, so we want to work out what is its new probability, i.e. what is its probability conditional on x on x uh, being greater than or equal to s having occurred. Now, um, this intersection is a bit uh, redundant because uh, the set, the event x is greater than or equal to s plus t is completely contained within the set x is greater than or equal to s. So in fact, this is just equal to the probability that x is greater than or equal to s plus t uh, divided by the probability that x is greater than or equal to s. So this uh, is exactly uh, by definition g of s plus t and the under thing is g of s. So we get now a functional equation. We get that uh, g of s plus t divided by g of s is equal to g of t. And this is true, true uh, for all s and t are positive real numbers. Uh, note, we already know what g of t is if um, if uh, t is less than or equal to zero. So it's the prob it's well, it's equal to the probability that x is greater than or equal to t. Uh, so in this case, we're just going to define it to be equal to one. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be well defined because the CDF uh, for all of those uh, negative numbers is going to be equal to zero. So g of t is automatically going to have to equal one if you're negative. So there's no freedom there. So this is only true for the positive numbers s and t. Okay, uh, so now this implies that g of s plus t is equal to g of t times g of s. And I want you to find me, find me a function, find me a function g, g, which maps the positive real numbers, oh dear, the positive real numbers, 0 to infinity, onto, again, it has to be mapped onto the, um, it has to be mapped onto uh, 0 to 1. Uh, so it, it can't go over 1 and it can't go under 0. Uh, so I want you to find me such a function uh, that satisfies this, this um, functional equation here. So this is uh, something called a functional equation because you're looking, the solution to it is a function rather than uh, just a value. Okay, so let's try and solve this then. Uh, so uh, we know that g of s plus t is equal to g of s times g of t. So let's just say what that means. That means uh, that uh, if we look at the point zero here, and you have two positive numbers s and t, uh, then g of uh, and you take uh, you take um, where would it be around there, wouldn't it? Uh, if you take the point s plus t here, uh, then the value of the function ascribed to this this is g of s plus t has to equal the value of this uh, ascribed to this value here g of t times g of s. So it has to equal these two multiplied together. So firstly, let's just let, uh, let s and t both be the same number. So let them both be the same number. Then we get that g of 2 times whatever this number is has to be equal to g of t uh, times g of t. Uh, so it has to equal g of t squared. OK, so all I said there was here is 0, here is, here is t. Uh, add t onto itself and we'll get 2t and uh, this the value of g of 2t must equal g of t times g of t because those are the two constituent pieces of it. Uh, so uh, we get that g of 2t is equal to g of t squared. Similarly we can say what is g of 3t? Well we could split this up into g of 2t plus t which by our, our functional equation must equal g of 2t times g of t but g of 2t, we already know, is g of t, sque t squared. Uh, so we'll get that this is g of t s to the power of 3, uh, because you'll combine this one with this one. So if we want to know what is g of kt, uh, then uh, it's going to be equal to g of t to the power of k, if k is a natural number. And the reason for that is you can just do induction. Uh, if uh, Assume it's true for g uh, for k, uh, and we've got, we know, of course, that it's true for uh, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, so assume it's true for k. Let's prove it's true for g, uh, k plus 1. So uh, k plus 1 of t uh, is equal to g of kt uh, plus t. And then by the functional equation, you can just write this as g of kt times g of t. 
and g of kt by assumption was equal to g of t to the k. Uh, so you're multiplying g of t to the k by g of t, so you're just going to get g of t to the k plus 1. Uh, so basically, if it's true for k, it's true for k plus 1, and since it's true for 1, 2, 3, it's true for 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, so by induction, uh, this formula here works. Okay, similarly, uh, we can say, well, uh, conversely actually, we can use this now and say, what about dividing t by some uh, ra uh, some natural number? So let's say k is equal to a natural number, oh dear, natural number n. Okay, uh, well basically now we just stick it into this side of the equation. So if we take g of t over k to the power of k, then it is equal to g of k and now we stick in t over k, and uh, this is going to give us um, this is going to give us that g of t over k is equal to on this side the k's cancel and we could just get g of t, and then what we're going to do is raise it to the power of one over k. So that formula also holds for all natural numbers from this one basically. Um, and remember, t is some positive number. We're always assuming that t is some positive number uh, because we know what it is if it's a negative number. OK, so now let's say, uh, what is g of m n t, where m is a natural number and n is an element of the natural numbers? Well, we can view this as g of m times 1 over n t. And basically, we can then apply uh, this equation up here and say that that is equal to... Um, g of 1 over n t to the power of m and then we can apply this equation here and say that that is uh, g of t to the 1 over n uh, to the power of m which is equal to g of t oh dear g of t uh, to the power of m over n oh dear right there we go uh, so this basically says that if we have g times any positive uh, g of Qt, where Q is a positive rational number, it's just equal to g of t uh, to the power of Q. Okay, so that's great. Uh, now, uh, any real number r, uh, the, which is positive, some real number, a pol any positive real number uh, can be uh, written as uh, the limit as n approaches infinity of a sequence of rational numbers. Uh, so real numbers in a way are just sequences of rational numbers. Uh, so uh, as the archetypal example, uh, pi, you can write as 3, uh, then 3.1, 3.14, 3.141, 3.1415, 3.1415, those are all rational numbers and they will eventually converge on pi. So that's one of the key ways in which we can represent real numbers as uh, Cauchy sequences of rational numbers. Okay, uh, so um, so um, now that we've got this, what we can say is if we want g of r, uh, well, g of qn of t, then this is equal to g of t uh, to the power of qn, because qn is just some positive rational. And of course, if r is greater than zero, we can always find a sequence of positive rationals that converge on it. I, I don't want you to find me have negative rationals in there because that gets awkward because this won't work if they're negative. Okay, uh, so then I can just take the limit of both sides basically. The limit as n approaches infinity of g of qn t is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of g of t to the qn. Okay, uh, so uh, let's get some more paper. Okay, and this side is just going to be equal to g of r of t, and on this side we're just going to end up with g of t to the power of r. Okay, uh, so for any real number, this or for any positive real number, this holds true, and therefore let t just equal one, and we get that g of any positive real number is equal to g of one uh, to the power of that real number. Okay, and that holds for all uh, r is greater than zero. Okay, so that implies then uh, that um, f, uh, so let's just replace this with some arbitrary constant. Uh, so uh, because we'd like to have this um, as 
uh, e, we'd like to put e there, the constant e, what we can do is we could write, uh, how do you do this, you write e to the r, and then there's the natural logarithm of g of 1, let's see if that makes sense, uh, so we could write, we could split this up uh, by laws of logarithms, we could split this up as e to the natural log of g of 1, or to the power of r, and now if you take the exponential of a logarithm, that just goes back to what it was. So yes, that works. Uh, so basically, uh, I've done this backwards. Uh, you could take g of 1 to the power of r, and you could write that as the exponential of the logarithm of g of 1. And then what we do is we'd, uh, we'd apply a law of exponentials, which says that if you take something like this to the power of this, then it just is this to the power of these two multiplied together. Uh, so we can say that this is uh, that g of r... Uh, which we might, uh, r isn't a pretty typical uh, variable, so let's say g of little x is equal to e to the x, the natural logarithm of g of 1. Okay, uh, so um, this is looking pretty good. Uh, now we know that uh, big F of x, the CDF, is just equal to 1 minus uh, big G of x, so the CDF becomes 1 minus e to the x, the natural logarithm of g of 1. And we know that the only way this is can be a um, uh, can be a valid uh, PDF uh, well can be a valid CDF uh, is uh, if uh, this converges on equaling zero because the limit as x approaches infinity uh, of uh, big F of x needs to equal one, uh, which implies that this limit must equal zero. So the limit as x approaches infinity of uh, e of x, the natural logarithm of g of one. Uh, must equal 0. And the only way that this is going to equal 0 is if the natural logarithm of g of 1 is less than 0. So, uh, let's replace it by, uh, let's say, uh, lambda is equal to negative the natural logarithm of g of 1, uh, So, which means that lambda is going to be greater than 0, and then we can just write this function as e to the negative lambda of x, uh, because it was... Uh, if we look at the CDF, sorry, this, the CDF would be f of x is equal to 1 minus that. Okay, uh, sorry, let me bring this up into a uh, good view. Uh, so basically what I've done is I've said let lambda equal uh, this number here, the negative of this. Now, uh, our CDF was 1 minus e to the x times this. Uh, so if I want to replace it with lambda, I'm going to have to put a negative sign there to make it correct. And this looks exactly uh, like uh, the CDF of an exponential distribution. So uh, the random variable x was dis and of course we know of course that the uh, x uh, that big F of x was equal to zero if x was less than or equal to zero. So x the random variable x is indeed exponentially distributed with parameter lambda <laughs> if it's memoryless. Uh, now, the reason that I say that this is a um, proof in quotation marks uh, is because we were always assuming, we were assuming uh, that um, we assumed right from the beginning that uh, our random variable, uh, big X, was mapping you onto the positive, uh, positive real numbers rather than the whole real numbers. And uh, if you map it onto the whole real numbers and try and prove it, it's a little bit more technical. Uh, but uh, on, to the, on the positive real numbers, we definitely have a nice proof there.